Uh, well, good morning as well, and I appreciate that everybody is joining us uh, this morning for this really interesting, fascinating topic that I have just had the pleasure of being able to just have, just in the short conversation the four of us had, it was a really, really uh, interesting conversation. So I hope you will reap the same uh, enjoyment from it, and feel free to ask questions um, at the end of the session. We'll make sure they're moderated and handled, and for those online doing the same, those will also be moderated, so yes, do ask questions. But before uh, any of that, I should say my name is Todd Brennan. Uh, I received my master's degree in freshwater sciences from the UW Milwaukee in 2014. Uh, so nothing to do with this subject matter, but we all have curiosities, and that's definitely why I'm here. I'm also serve on the United uh, University of Wisconsin Milwaukee Alumni Board of Directors, Alumni Association Board of Directors. So uh, I jumped at the opportunity in part because I have a daughter who's really into this, and uh, she's so much so she's thinking about. This is how she's making her college decisions on where she can go to study criminal science. So I've been indoctrinated into all kinds of podcasts and television shows I never would have watched on my own. But our whole family now has robust discussions about these kind of things and where it sits with us. Uh, sometimes very thought-provoking, too, of why are we fascinated by this, which has led us to a different place. So I was really fascinated to hear the subject matter because it's something we've been talking about and thinking about for quite a bit. So with that, I want to thank you for joining us at the Master Chat along with Dr. Stacy Nye, who's going to be delivering this Master Chat, um, not to be confused with Bill Nye, the science guy. We had a robust discussion about this. Apparently, he's not really. Um, her husband is also Dr. Nye, so, and he's a scientist, so he might be the real science guy. Okay. There's a whole family of influence going on here. Uh, Dr. Stacy Nye is a clinical psychologist and owner of Nye Psychotherapy, a clinical professor of psychology and director of UW-Milwaukee's Psychology Clinic. Dr. Nye is also a podcaster and created and hosts The Blank That Happens to Me. I'll let your imaginations fill in what the real name of that is, um, but you can look it up, or it's in the description, and created and co-hosts another podcast called Psychoanalyzing the Patient, which if I just learned is a television show, so this is a companion analysis to that show. Uh, Dr. Nye is a true crime aficionado and is regularly interviewed by television and radio programs on the topic. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Stacy Nye to begin our master chat, which is titled The Psychology Behind the Rise and Popularity of True Crime Media. Dr. Nye, take it away. Hi, everyone. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. So, can you hear me even when I do this or not as much? Not as much. So, maybe I'll just hold it. Okay. So, um, welcome to my master chat today on the psychology behind the rise in popularity of true crime media. So, I'm going to start with this idea that you walk into a party, you're looking for people to talk to, and on one side of the room, you see my husband, and he is involved in a conversation with some friends and relatives about Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers. On the other side of the room, you might see some of my psychology colleagues. And they are also deeply involved in a conversation about grants and curriculum and maybe our graduate students. And then far in the corner, you see a group of women. And these women are talking in hushed tones, with their eyes open wide. And some words float out like, blood splatter, or fingerprint analysis, or DNA, or serial killer. Which conversation do you go talk to? Do you join? If you're anything like me, you make a beeline over to those women to talk about serial killers and true crime. So what is it about that topic that draws so many? And I want to be clear that it doesn't draw all of us. My husband, Steve, is only here today because I'm speaking. He 
he would never, ever join a conversation about true crime otherwise. And in fact, when I'm listening to podcasts or watching something, when he walks into the room, I know to pause it now because he does not want to hear anything about, and then she took the knife and slit his throat. But first, a content warning. Please note that this presentation contains, well, a swear word or two and depictions depictions of violence, which some people might find disturbing. So if you're not a true crime fan, we're dragged here by someone who is, feel free if you don't want to hear those um, descriptions. Everyone remembers their first case, the first time they got hooked by true crime. Abby was just telling us a few moments ago. For me, it was a TV miniseries called Fatal Vision back in the 70s. And this was the story of former Green Beret Jeffrey McDonald, who was accused of killing his pregnant wife and daughters. The actor Gary Cole was in this, and I've never been able to look at him the same since watching that show. But um, it really hooked me. And I want to say, like, watching, I was pretty convinced that he was guilty as was the author of the book that the show was um, based on. But he's proclaimed his innocence from the very beginning. He's still in jail, proclaiming his innocence. And that's one of the fascinating things about true crime is we never really know for sure. Without that smoking gun, and even with that smoking gun sometimes, you just don't know the answer. So a little background first. True crime and fascination with true crime has been around for a very long time, ever since the invention of movable type. The public has wanted to consume true crime media. So for example, back in the 1700s, there were um, things created called murder pamphlets. So this one in particular, um, I think the date is 17 something, um, is about the case of Mary Blandy. And Mary Blandy um, poisoned her father because he disapproved of her relationship. And Mary Blandy was um, executed for that. So murder pamphlet, and this is one of like four in the series of Mary Blandy. So these murder pamphlets were created by print shops um, and they would tell the account of some crime that happened in whatever neighborhood you know they were in. Sometimes they were set out like a puzzle so you could try to guess who did it. Sometimes they were full true accounts um, with witness testimony or comments or things like that. So that's been around a very long time. Also books. So maybe you all read true crime books. One example is In Cold Blood. And I want to make mention that In Cold Blood is actually a nonfiction novel. So that means that it's based on a nonfiction case with um, fictionalized elements, maybe conversations or things like that. So In Cold Blood, written by Truman Capote, about the murder of the Clutter family in um, Holcomb, Kansas. Um, this book was also, you know, and this is common, made into a movie. Maybe you saw the movie with Robert Blake. And Robert Blake, who recently died, by the way, was actually at the center of his own murder mystery when he was accused of killing his wife, Bonnie Lee Blakely. Bakley. And um, although he was found innocent in court, he was found responsible in a civil case and was ordered to pay like $30 million, which basically bankrupt him and labeled him forever as a killer. Next is uh, another example, Helter Skelter by Vincent Bugliosi. My sister was really fascinated by um, Charles Manson, and she had this book laying around the house when we were young. And, and I will just add that I come by this interest honestly. My, my sister, I watched horror shows with her. My mother watched a lot of murder shows. I would wake up in the middle of the night, and she'd be downstairs in the family room watching some, you know, Perry Mason, whatever she was watching, and I would 
sit with her and watch with her from a fairly young age. But Helter Skelter is um, written by the prosecutor, so it's his first-hand account of the trial of um, Charles Manson and the self-described Manson family, so they call themselves that. I'll also just add that there's been a recent movie, a few years ago, by Quentin Tarantino based on um, these events, and it's called Once Upon a Time in America, and it is not a true account of of those events, so keep that in mind if you go watch it. Another example is um, the book Mindhunter by John Douglas. So John Douglas was one of the people who basically invented FBI profiling, and he and his partner did countless interviews in jail, of in prisons of serial killers. And so they, they came up with a method of, you know, being able to, you know, identify what some of the traits, common traits there would be um, when, when looking for, you know, the, the perpetrator of these crimes. When I read this book, I, I came very close to switching careers because I was just fascinated by this personality profiling as a psychologist. Um, it's probably better that I didn't do that, but... So it's a wonderful book, and there's many books um, that he's written. And one, one other example is The Night Stalker. So this is um, based on death row interviews of Richard Ramirez, one of the most horrific serial killers of all time. And um, Philip Carlo um, was his... Um, attorney, and um, he wrote this book based on, you know, the trial. And um, I want to add that um, when it was first published, there were countless women from all over the world who reached out to Philip Carlo wanting to be put in touch with Richard Ramirez. So this is a very strange phenomena of, you know, um, not only being fascinated by serial killers, but falling in love with serial killers. There's also television and, and movie accounts. So I want to mention that there's a couple of different kinds. So there's documentary and dramatized. So I just have two examples of that here. Um, Making a Murderer, um, many of you maybe have seen that um, show on Netflix. And this is about um, the story of Stephen Avery, who's from Manitowoc County. And Stephen Avery was convicted of um, a sexual assault, an attempted murder, and was in prison for 18 years when that um, was overturned. That conviction was overturned based on um, DNA evidence. So he was released from prison, and then like two years later was accused of murdering Teresa Hallbeck. He and his nephew, Brendan Dassey, were both found guilty of those murders, and they made this show, Making a Murderer. I think there's two, maybe three seasons of that. I only watched the first season. But um, so, so I want to say, though, even though this is a documentary, like I said earlier, when, when you watch these things, the filmmakers have a bias. They just do. And often that gets comes out when, when you watch. So after I watched this show, I was convinced that Brendan Dassey probably didn't do it, that he was coerced by his attorneys to say certain things um, and wasn't represented well. But both of those um, convictions still hold, and they're both um, still in jail today. Dahmer, this um, show that was recently on in September, is a fictionalized account of Jeffrey Dahmer. This show was done by Ryan Murphy, who does the, um, he actually did Glee, which is, seems kind of interesting, but also all the American Horror Story shows. And um, so Dahmer is a fictionalized account of the Jeff Jeffrey Dahmer. Um, I want to say that this show was big news because it, reached the number one spot on Netflix in the first week of its release, and everybody was talking about this show, like the, one of the most, um, most watched 
series of all times on Netflix. It was nominated several times for Golden Globes, and um, Evan Peters won um, for his portrayal, you know, best actor of Jeffrey Dahmer. So this case has always fascinated people, the case of Jeffrey Dahmer, um, because he was not only a murderer, I'm gonna say some horrific things right now, he was into necrophilia, cannibalism, and the preservation of body parts. So really horrific, horrific things. But it, it particularly fascinates people here because this happened in our backyard. This happened in Milwaukee. And every time this comes up in conversation, I mean, I don't know how often you're having conversations about Jeffrey Dahmer, but you, you hear this account of, oh, like my friend Sarah, her mother used to work at Sears Roebuck in the catalog department, and apparently Jeffrey Dahmer bought his refrigerator there. And my friend Sarah's mother was contacted by his attorney trying to find out when he purchased that refrigerator, because if he purchased it after the murders, then it would seem less you know, um, premeditated. But in fact, he had not purchased them after the murders. So people can't help but say these things, talking to, um, you know, Abby beforehand, she's like, well, this thing happened to me. I was, you know, um, called for, you know, jury duty. Like, we all have these, like, stories. But again, with Jeffrey Dahmer, like, I don't know, maybe we passed him in the street. Maybe we worked with him at the candy store. Maybe we just narrowly escaped being one of his victims. podcasts. So true crime actually showed up on the radio first. Um, many years ago, there was a radio show called Murder Most Foul back in the 70s, which was like a docudrama series about um, that took place in England, um, where they talked about the facts and interesting things about, you know, true crime cases. So then podcasting was invented in 2004. Generation Y was one of the very first true crime podcasts, and that's still on, actually. But Serial is one of the podcasts that most people identify with, oh, that's the first time I listened to a podcast or a true crime podcast. So Serial is an investigative journalism podcast hosted by Sarah Koenig. And um, what that means is, you know, she's a journalist, and so she's done a lot of research on, on the cases that she talks about. So one case is presented over the season, and so you're really doing like a deep dive on this case. So season one um, was the investigation of the killing of Heyman Lee by her ex-boyfriend Adnan Syed. Maybe you've heard of this case. Um, he was found guilty back in 2000, was given a life sentence, and then in 2022, his conviction was overturned um, because of um, something, some evidence that was not turned over to the prosecution in time, or the defense, pardon me. So, um, and I just heard that, um, thank you, Abby, who just told me that actually they're rescinding that overturning because apparently when they had the um, hearing where they overturned his sentence, the family was, the Min family was not included in the hearing and it was their right to be included. Now, I don't know if he'll go back to jail or not, but anyone who maybe listened to the podcast thought that he was innocent. So again, there's that, you know, the, the bias, and I'm sure Sarah Koenig, well, actually, I, I take that back. She maybe would admit that she was biased about it, but um, so we all, have, we, we, get, we get biased by these things that we, that we watch and listen to. So Serial was ranked number one on iTunes. Um, it won a Peabody Award, and um, the seasons one and two, I think there's three seasons now, has been downloaded over 340 million times. So that's a lot of people listening to these cases. Next is another example, um, is My Favorite Murder. So um, any My Favorite Murder fans in the room? Okay, so, so um, My Favorite Murder calls itself a true crime comedy podcast. So the hosts are comedians. 
And they actually met at a party, which is where I got my imagine you're at a party example. So um, Karen Kilgariff was at this Halloween party telling a story about a car accident she saw. Georgia Hartstark heard her tell the story, made a beeline over there to hear more of the gory details. They became friends, discovered they had this interest, and um, decided to start a podcast. And as of 2020, their podcast was getting 35 million downloads um, a month. So this is like outrageous. These two people just kind of skyrocketed to fame. Now let me say, like, if you don't listen to podcasts, if you don't listen to true crime, you've probably never heard of them. But in the podcast world, in the true crime world, they're very, very well known. Um, there's been, there's been some controversies. I'm not going to get into that right now. But nevertheless, this was a podcast that I listened to. Um, and their fans call themselves murderinos. So a murderino is someone who defines themselves as a person with a borderline obsessive interest in true crime and the specific nature and details of disturbing murders. So there are countless Facebook groups, actually, for murderinos, things that even have nothing to do with murder, but it's become like a bit of a sisterhood. There are some men who are murderinos, but it's predominantly women. I'm going to talk about that in a little while. But um, so, and, and so Georgia Hartstark and Karen Kilgariff, um, I don't know, they're maybe in their sixth or seventh season right now. They wrote a book. They started a, their own network. They did hundreds of live shows across the world before COVID. So why do we love true crime so much? Now I'm getting to what you're all here for. So there's a few reasons why we love it so much. One of the reasons is Good storytelling. So true crime has all of the basics of good storytelling. There's interesting characters. There's a sense of urgency and, you know, like, oh, anticipation and tension that hopefully is resolved when the mystery is solved at the end. Not only that, true crime follows a pretty similar format. And I know people who say things like, well, what do you, what do you watch when you're laying in bed getting ready to you know, go to sleep. And so many true crime fans will say things like cold case files or forensic files. So there's something about the, the format, you know, like there's a murder, they, they interview all of the suspects, at the end they solve the case, maybe, unless it's, well, cold case files, obviously they're not solving the case. But anyway, so it's easy to identify who the bad guys are, who the good guys are, and we just find that, you know, really comforting in a way um, that we know what's going to basically happen. Another reason is that evil fascinates us. So it's human nature to be curious about what drives people to commit these horrific acts. And so the true crime genre gives us a peek in to um, what goes on in the minds of people who do these things. So this is like a book I listened to. So again, every time Steve walked in, I had a pause it. Um, Scott Bond wrote this book. He interviewed a lot of um, people about, you know, why, you know, why they're interested in um, true crime and death and murder and things like that. But this is, this has gone on forever. And even kids are fascinated by this thing between good and evil. So think about Harry Potter. I was thinking about this the other day. Like, you remember that people get sorted, right? Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin. So not everyone was chosen to Gryffindor, and not everyone wanted to be in Gryffindor. And thinking back, the Slytherin kids were probably the coolest and the most attractive kids in the school. So you're just drawn, you're just drawn to that, oh, that would be really interesting to be chosen to be in that naughty group. We want to solve the mystery. So I don't know about you, but I love a good whodunit. Um, 
And a whodunit basically is a complex plot-driven variety of detective fiction in which the puzzle regarding who committed the crime is the main focus. So Murder on the Orient Express is a classic example of a whodunit um, written by Agatha Christie and remade into movies many, many times. Um, it's the story of the detective, Hercule Poirot, who is on this luxurious train, um, and there's a murder. Um, the nasty American gets murdered. He's stabbed 12 times, and the whole story is about who could it have been? All of the interviews of all of the suspects. I won't tell you who it was. If you haven't seen it or read it, I highly recommend it. More recently, Knives Out and Knives Out 2. I want to say, like, these aren't like great movies, but they're, they've been wildly popular for a similar reason. There's a horrific crime, there's an interesting detective, and then you have to figure out, or you know, um, someone solving the case. And again, this thing, and um, Todd was saying this earlier, like, the point is you wanna, we wanna solve the case, like, before we're told the answer. Like, if we can do that, then we feel really good about ourselves. I think this person did it, because they have all of the, you know, they, they lied about where they were, or we saw this, you know, so we're really drawn in to this puzzle. And, and true crime provides us with that, um, gets our brain going in a similar way. And if we follow an investigation, we can basically be an armchair detective. And um, maybe we're going to solve the case right before law enforcement does. Wouldn't that be awesome? Another reason is we love to be scared in a controlled way. So true crime allows us to experience the fear and the horror and all the other things, but from the safety of our couch. Um, so think of like horror, like I don't know if there's any horror fans in the audience. I like horror, um, and horror really gets us going. So on a physical level, we might feel, you know, like tense and our heart might pound. We might feel this sense of dread. And on an emotional level, we feel anxious, we feel disgusted maybe, we feel curious. So it's really affecting us on numerous, numerous levels. But the fact that we're fascinated by us by this depends on us actually being safe. So if we're watching a zombie movie and the zombies came out of the television set, we would no longer be enjoying that movie, right? Because suddenly we're not safe anymore. So the fact that we're able to watch things and say, oh, that's an actor, or even like go to a haunted house on Halloween, we know that those are high school students who are reaching out to grab us like in costumes. So the fact that we can be interested in this, but from the safety of our couch, um, makes it okay. We also maybe are living out kind of alternative realities. So if you watch any like apocalyptic shows, you might be prepared should there be an apocalypse. I personally can't watch apocalypse or zombies myself. Um, I can watch the most dreadful murder and crime and blood and stuff like that, but there's something just about zombies and apocalypse that get me going. So see me afterwards, because I might need to come stay with you should we have a zombie apocalypse. Because <laughs> you'll all know what to do. Another reason why we're fascinated by this is the 24-hour news cycle. So since the 50s, actually, we've been bombarded in the media with accounts of crime stories. But the invention of the internet and the 24-hour news cycle, which is a constant stream of investigative reporting, has really increased our fascination and our kind of you know, um, need to watch it. So you've maybe heard this saying, if it bleeds, it leads. I think it was in that movie back in the 50s about the you know people in, who worked in the newspaper. But anyway, um, so what that means is that violent predatory crimes against people are sensationalized and prioritized in the news. So in fact, it's estimated that you know up to 30 percent of the top stories on the news are based on like crimes that have happened against people. What 
what about women? You know, in my example earlier, I talked about how um, women are fascinated um, in particular. And studies have shown consistently that women um, consume more true crime than men do. Um, and women fear being the victims of crime more than men do, even though men are statistically more likely to be a victim of a crime. So they call this um, the gender fear paradox, that women who are afraid, more afraid of being a victim, actually are more fascinated by true crime. So one of the more prominent explanations is called the shadow hypothesis, which means that women's basic fear of being assaulted or sexually assaulted um, pervades their, their whole life. Their entire, every, everywhere we go as a woman, you know, walking down the street, we're, we're kind of on alert, you know, like is this person gonna like attack us? I don't care how old we are, we're taught at a very young age that, you know, we could um, be victims. And so one thought is that women consume true crime to kind of get tips you know, um, to prepare them. If they can watch something, they might say, oh, I'm not gonna do that, or I'm gonna do that, or I'm gonna take a self-defense class so that I can be prepared should this happen to me. So driven by our longing for survival, um, we, we watch this kind of like a dress rehearsal. And this, and I've heard this, I've asked my Murderino friends, you know, um, why do you watch true crime? And I, I hear this answer all the time. There's the swear word, sorry. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit more about this like survival. So back to my favorite murder for a moment. So they offer a lot of unqualified advice, Karen and Georgia. But one of the favorite things that I've heard them say is this comment, fuck politeness, part of my language. And I wanna tell you what this means because women in particular are socialized to always be nice and kind and not cause any trouble and not go in any conflict and just to kind of get along, right? And so we end up ignoring our instincts um, because we don't want to look foolish or we don't want to get in trouble. So um, maybe you pass someone on the street and you're a little creeped out or maybe he gets too close to you and you just kind of, like, you know what actually women do? Like, they actually say things like, I'm sorry. Like, why? Why are we apologizing when men are being creepy? But if we report it, then we're made to feel like we've done something wrong. Now, I would like to think that those tides are changing in the workplace. I don't know, not, not fast enough for me, but reporting incidents like this make us look bad and target us in ways that are like outrageous. So, fuck politeness. I'm telling all of you women in the audience, like don't, don't do that anymore. You, you pass some, I, I was just telling my friends I was like leaving Nordstrom's the other day, a while ago, and um, it was nighttime, and there was like this man coming in as I was walking out, and I just literally went like this. I just gave him a very wide berth as he walked in, because I just didn't want to get close enough for him to be able to touch me. Now, maybe I looked stupid. I don't care. Fuck politeness, okay? Okay, so I want to tell you about this show called I Survived. Um, I'm going to describe a very, you know, difficult case, but it ends well. That's why it's called I Survived. So this show, hello? Yeah, this show is about people who have been in horrific situations, not just crimes, who have survived and they tell their tale about that. So there is an episode um, about the story of Mary Vincent. So Mary Vincent was 15 years old and was hitchhiking from um, LA to Las Vegas. And no judgment about the fact that she was hitchhiking, okay? We're gonna get back to that in a few minutes. She was picked up by um, Lawrence Singleton. She was brutally raped all night long. She was tortured, her arms were cut off, and she was thrown down a cliff. He left her for dead. He thought that she was dead at that point, but she was not dead. She got herself up. 
you can see her picture there. She packed her arms, sorry, she packed her arms into mud to stop the bleeding. She climbed out of this 30-foot cliff, naked and bleeding, and walked down the turnpike for three miles until someone finally came by and stopped and picked her up. So this is a case where you think, like, not only how horrible, right, but I, I could survive. Like, she's like a hero. And when this, this she, so she was on the show I Survived, but she was also, the story was told on My Favorite Murder. And everybody went and started looking her up and watching her episode. And I think, you know, she just wants to, like, have her nice, quiet life now. So she kind of got in the spotlight, which I don't think she wanted, but. Some women are drawn to the psychological content and the science, so understanding the killer's motives um, and, how, and how these things work. And you were just saying your daughter is going to go into schooling for something like that. So this is Dr. Laura Petler. She's a forensic criminologist. I actually had her on my other podcast that Todd mentioned earlier, Psychoanalyzing the Patient. Um, and so she invented this kaleidoscope shooting recon system where they take lasers and they can see the pathway of bullets and things like that. So forensic science plays a huge role in um, criminal justice. And there have been recent advances, you know, like DNA testing, um, that, that have been really helpful. In fact, if anyone wants to donate money to um, do DNA testing for all of the rape kits that have never been tested all around the country, that's a great, that's a great thing to put your money to. Because now there's just more than they can even get to. But anyway, um, so there's an increased, um, you know, people going into programs like this, women in particular, going into these um, programs to learn about and be on that side of, you know, those investigations, whether it's to be, you know, a criminal forensic criminologist or be in the morgue or, or things like that. So. And one of the reasons this is happening is what they call the CSI effect. So I've been watching CSI Vegas, that's the only one I watch, since the very beginning. And though I actually went to Chicago with my son and we did this like CSI exhibit where we got to analyze fingerprints and stuff like that. It's fascinating. So this is like a worldwide phenomenon. Um, are fascinated by this and you know want to go into programs or play games or read books or things like that. I have a little video for you. So that was just on SNL, I think, in 2022. So obviously, um, this is relevant. All right. So, so are there any problems with this fascination in true crime? A few, there's a few problems. So internet sleuths is, is one example, and again, like these are great. So people who are retired can actually get involved in helping people solve crimes because there's not enough police, you know, anywhere to be able to do this. Um, the problem is like if, if you wanna do that, like do that and take all of the information that you find and send it to the police, don't go don't go calling anybody out online. Don't go, you know, um, interviewing people. You know, like, you have no place doing that. You can get hurt, and you can be sued for slander, and you can mess up on um, police investigations. So cool thing, but keep your place where it is on the couch. Um, victim blaming. So hindsight's 2020. So we can, remember I made that comment about don't go telling me she shouldn't have um, hitchhiked. Maybe she shouldn't have. But that doesn't mean that she wanted that to happen to her. But it's very common for people to watch these shows and say, well, that would never happen to me because I would never hitchhike. So this kind of victim blaming is very common, particularly in crimes against women. So I don't, I. I don't know, I don't know what to say about that, but um, so be careful that um, you, you don't want to say things like, well, she shouldn't have worn that, she shouldn't have gone there, um, because 
no one wants to be in that situation. And I just put this movie up because I don't know if you all saw this movie where, you know, um, based on a true story where she was blamed basically for being gang raped. Some of these shows demonize mental illness. So there's a recent example where we're talking about the mental illness of the shooter. And I want to say that most people who commit, I'm actually, I'm just going to go back and say serial killers in particular, usually are not mentally ill. Um, they're not insane, um, which is a legal term. but. Um, and they might have some personality issues like sociopathy, but the reality is is that crimes happen more to people, to people who have mental illness, than people who are mentally ill committing crimes. So these things are often um, demonized. And, and the reality is a lot of people who commit these like serial killers are are living in in you know right next door to us. They are members of their church. They are married. They have children. While they're committing all these horrific crimes, and people would never know. So we started a few minutes late because according to that, I should be stopping now. Is that an accurate time there? Keep going. Okay, great. Um, often um, the violence is glorified um, and sexualized even. So I was going to show this, this brief clip, but I'm not going to do that. But there is a, a movie called Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil and Vile about Ted Bundy. It's just a fictionalized, um, dramatized you know, um, story of his events. And the actor who plays him is Zac Efron, who's very handsome. And in this little clip, like it's really just the preview, like he's constantly winking, you know? So, so Ted Bundy in particular, he was quite handsome and quite brilliant. He was a horrific, terrible person, right? But yet he's kind of built up, you know, to people who, who listen to these things because he was kind of handsome and sexy. And that's that's just like wrong. So these 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 people are are um, glorified in a way that is not helpful. And um, Related to that, not enough emphasis is placed on the victims and their families. So that was one of the criticisms of the Dahmer show that his victims were not were were there were a few named, but um, they weren't even um, the victims' families weren't even consulted for the show. So they feel really um, exploited. They feel like Netflix, you know, um, based not only re-traumatized them, but basically. Um, you know, um, were, got money, basically, you know, like rose to fame based on their suffering. So, you know, more emphasis could certainly be placed on the victims and their families. Um, the CSI effect, as I mentioned earlier, so what ha what's happening now is that juries, jurors, are waiting for the forensic science. They have an unrealistic view of how long DNA analysis actually takes, and they're unlikely, they, they are sometimes unlikely to convict people if there's no forensic evidence. So um, they've started vetting people to find out like if they watch these shows and maybe not putting those people on the jury. So a lot of true crime has focused primarily on white, privileged women who go missing, and that's, that's still the case. Um, and so stories about women of color, especially black and indigenous women and trans women, are often left out of, of true crime. So that's really problematic that um, the white women are getting all of the attention, and some of these other cases are not being, being looked at. They also lead to myths about who who a serial killer might be. Um, they're only white men, and that's not true. There are many many examples of you know um, killers who are of all races. It mirrors kind of the population, um, and also women like Eileen Warnos was um, a pretty well known um, serial killer. They called she called they called her the damsel of death. She was a street worker, and she killed many of her um, clients. Finally, um, some people might have 
reactions might feel triggered to watching true crime. So if you're someone who you know, has found yourself having nightmares after reading or watching something, or you've become afraid to leave your house, you should probably back off the true crime for a little while. Lastly, I want to share with you some of my favorite cases or ironic coincidences or interesting captures of people. So I'm also not going to show this clip, but um, this is from the movie The Exorcist. So there was, I mean, it's a horror film, right? And plenty of, of um, kind of interesting things happened on the set, like... Um, Let's see, Ellen Burstyn suffered a back injury. The set caught fire one day. Loved ones of cast members like inexplicably died. They actually had a priest come and do an exorcism on the set, like a real priest come and do that because they, they thought that the production was cursed. But one of the more interesting things that happened is um, the, the creator, William Friedkin, wanted a sense of reality in, in his film. And so there's a scene where Linda Blair is getting a, a neurological procedure. I think they're doing like a CAT scan or something. And um, so William Friedkin wanted the actual surgeon, neurosurgeon from the hospital, and his team in the film. And later we find out that this young man, who was the um, tech, neuropsych tech, was a killer himself. So he, many years later, he was convicted of um, murder. Sorry, I had the whole like music in the background too, but I don't think we have time for that. Um, Anne Rule was a nonfiction writer. She wrote many, many books about true crime. And as it happens, she worked at a rape hotline right next to Ted Bundy. They were friends. She liked him a lot. Um, he was very charming, as I was alluding to before. So she had no idea that he was a serial killer. And in fact, when some of the evidence started coming out about what he looked like, the car he drove, she was just like, no, that can't possibly be my friend Ted, when actually it was. Ted Bundy, I just want to add, escaped from prison twice. He was finally captured when the car he stole had a light out. Um, and he was pulled over by a policeman who had no idea who he had just pulled over. Um, he pulled him over, um, discovered the car was stolen, and brought him in, realized that he was the person who finally caught Ted Bundy. Um, Joseph James D'Angelo is um, an American serial killer, sex offender, burglar, and former police officer. Um, he committed... 13 murders, at least 13 murders, 51 rapes, 120 burglaries across California. Michelle McNamara was a journalist. She was fascinated by true crime, and she was fascinated by this case. Um, and she actually coined the phrase, um, the Golden State Killer. So this, this person was caught decades after he even stopped committing crimes. And he was caught by... Um, genetic genealogy. So when that, you know, like 23andMe and things like that. So when they finally had that, and the FBI had to get special permission because those sites are supposed to be confidential, they uploaded the Golden State Killer's DNA to the website. They got hundreds of hits, actually, that he, that shared with like a, you know, great, 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 great grandchildren, apparently. They built a whole family tree, and they narrowed it down to um, Joseph James D'Angelo. They went to his house. They took surreptitiously, took fingerprints off of his doorknob, and they took, went into his garbage and took some dirty Kleenex, and they were able to discover that he was the Golden State Killer. So many, many years um, afterwards, he was um, captured. It was a great, this just happened like a few years ago. So it was a great, it was a great thing. Now, unfortunately, Michelle McNamara died before she could see him captured, but she was instrumental in bringing his case um, out to the public. Um, and her, her book was completed by 
um, someone else. And there's an HBO special too that I highly recommend. I have some tissue nearby because if you know about Michelle McNamara, you feel bad about it. I'm just gonna skip that one for now um, and tell you about my favorite case. You see, like, I can't help but say, like, oh, this is my favorite case. It's my favorite capture. So John List, um, back in the 1970s, killed his wife, his mother, and his three children. He left them in his house, turned the air conditioning up high, and fled, and changed his name, um, became a new person, moved across the country. And um, he planned these murders so well that it took a while before people even knew what had happened, that, that these people were missing. So he eluded justice for like 18 years. He had um, relocated to Denver. He changed his name to Bob Clark. Um, he joined a Lutheran congregation and did a carpool for shut-in church members. So like no one would ever suspect this person who was seemingly good had done this. But 18 years after the crime, his case was shown on America's Most Wanted. And in the middle, you see they made a clay bust of this age regret, age, not regressed, age progressed, thank you, um, clay bust of what they thought John List would look like. And you can see he looks very much like what John List actually looked like at the time. And one of his neighbors in Denver recognized him and called the police and he was picked up two weeks later. So now back to the party. Which conversation are you gonna go talk to? Are you gonna go talk to my husband about Aaron Rodgers? He's gonna get very animated about it. Are you gonna go talk to my colleagues about psychology? Or are you gonna talk about true crime? You've heard all the gory details. There's many, many more. If you pick the latter, I'll be waiting for you after the Q&A. Thank you. All right, at this time, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and Zach will bring the microphone over to you. Don't be shy. Yes, Todd. Um, I, first, I want to just kind of, I should have said this at the beginning, I'm not a forensic criminologist, but nevertheless, I'll try to answer your question. I mean, I think that, you know, um, there is some evidence to show that watching violence on TV or in movies or in games can sometimes increase you know, um, violence in people who are already predisposed. So the average person is not going to be inspired to do something like that. However, there are copycat, you know, um, people who watch these things and say, oh, I want to do it that way. And then they are literally called copycat. So if you are already predisposed to violence in that way, you might get ideas. Yeah. Along with that, I wonder, I've been wondering about um, uh, what I know of as emotional intelligence quotient of an individual and the um, empathic nature or their level of compassion or whatever. You talked earlier about how some people can't watch these things before going to bed. I am a case in point. Um, and uh, because it does scare me. It scares me, and I, you know, uh, you said there are some people who watch these things and then they know what they would do in that situation. However, I also think that there's something to be said about watching that and being fearful then of 
possible intervention or possible things or things to a loved one um, who are vulnerable or whatever. And so I wondered about the emotional intelligence quotient factor. Is, is there something about certain people who, you know, and, and when I was growing up, my mother would always tell me, you take things to heart. You wear your sleep, you know, feelings on your shirt sleeve. You know, uh, now I'm told I'm more empathic than other people. Okay, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. I don't know, but I'm just asking if, if that's a factor in any of this. I mean, I think that maybe you're identifying with some of the victims in that, in that situation and, and feeling scared. And I would say that if that's, if that's not happening to you, I might worry a little bit. If you're able to watch these things or hear this talk and not gasp at some of the details that I shared, you know, um, then, then that might be worrisome. Um, but um, I, I, can't, I can't quote any specific, you know, um, evidence to, about that. But again, you know, um, and, and I, yeah, so sure, I think that, you know, really empathic people are going to watch these things and, and feel, you know, cry and be scared and, you know, um, either not want to go out their house or maybe you want to volunteer, you know, um, in shelters and things like that. But it would be hard work for you. Um, the expectation that all crimes are solvable. Is that true? It's true that crime shows create that expectation. But um, no, um, I, don't, I don't think that all crimes are solvable. In, in many cases, you need the, the victim. And if someone can get rid of that victim, I think it's very, very hard to solve a case because most of the physical evidence would be associated with that victim. Yeah, you had a question. Felt that the, uh, that it was a very hard case to win, you know, because there's really no motive to work with. But when the case was actually tried, most people would probably say the same thing. Just took one look at Manson and said he's guilty. Look at his appearance. Um, look at what he's saying and acting in court, that man is guilty, yet there was still, you know, there was one, one case to work, to work with. Well, and, and had we had time to watch my clip about Ted Bundy, like, there were people who would not believe that he was the person who committed these horrific crimes um, because he was so charming um, and put together and worked at a rape hotline. What are your thoughts on when they assign blame to a person post-mortem without a trial, such as in the Zodiac Killer case? I, I don't know, are you looking for my legal thoughts on that? Because um, I'm also not an attorney. But, um, you know, I think, I, I, I'm not sure I can answer that, actually. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll just add one other thing before we stop um, that I thought maybe where your question was going. Um, because sometimes, you know, we aren't completely, you know, maybe we don't believe that someone is guilty, or maybe we develop some empathy for the killer. So, for example, if you watch the show Dahmer, not the, not the, um, documentary, but the Ryan Murphy show, you might have felt a little empathy for him. He was a very tortured soul. Um, and he, there, are, there are people like um, um, John Wayne Gacy who are just evil and get off on torture. And that was not, 
Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, you might be horrified that I'm saying that I felt a little empathy for him, but he was not someone getting off on torture. But um, so that's just something to keep in mind also when, when viewing things or talking to people that we're all having different reactions, many of which might be influenced by whatever media we're watching or reading. Um, but that's all. Thank you. Uh, all right. Another round of applause for Dr. Nye. <laughs> Thank you. Um, please fill it out on your phone. Either way, we'll get the feedback. Um, and our next